Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. Today marks the continuation of our ongoing series dedicated to exploring the vital role of the CAO in municipal governance. In this installment, we explore the fascinating phenomenon, the transition from elected office to the role of CAO within municipalities. Our discussion will center on the experiences of three distinct guests who have traversed this unique path, offering insights from different regions across Canada. First, we have Duane Nickel, who brings a wealth of experience from the city of Selkirk, Manitoba, having served on a city council for over a decade before assuming the position of CAO in 2014, Duane offers a firsthand perspective of the transition from elected representative to administrative leader. Joining us as well is Jocelyn Whaley, whose journey spans multiple municipalities in Alberta and Manitoba. After her tenure as a councillor in Leduc County, Alberta, Jocelyn took on the role of CAO in both Brazo County, Alberta and the RM of Riding Mountain West, Manitoba. Currently serving as the Director of Infrastructure in Athabasca County, Jocelyn offers a nuanced understanding of the challenges and opportunities inherent in such transitions. Lastly, we have Jody Murray, who experiences bridges the province of Newfoundland and Labrador. From her time as mayor of the town of Bishop Falls to her current role as CAO of the town of Portugal Cove, St. Phillips, Jody brings insights shaped by her diverse municipal leadership journey. Throughout our discussion and roundtable today, we will explore the motivations behind these transitions, the skills and perspectives gained from elected office, and the nuances of balancing administrative duties with political acumen. So join us as we delve into this intriguing intersection of municipal governance and leadership. This is Municipal Affairs. Thank you all for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. I want to start by just opening up the floor for a brief second because we do have listeners who do not watch the show, but they actually do listen. So if everyone can just go around and give sort of the elevator pitch of who you are and what municipality you currently reside in and sort of your tenure from going from a CAO or from a councillor, council member to a CAO, we're going to start with the order that I see appearing on my screen. So Jody, starting in Newfoundland and Labrador, can you just get your to do a sort of quick introduction to the listeners and viewers. Yes, certainly. So I'm uh, Jody Murray, um, currently the Chief Administrative Officer for the town of Portugal Cove St. Phillips in Newfoundland and Labrador. And um, I actually, it was about um, 15 years ago that I was the mayor of a much smaller town in central Newfoundland. So I, I moved out uh, to the East Coast and uh, carried on in leadership roles before uh, coming back to the municipal world, coming back home. So here I am. Thank you so much, Jody. Duane, uh, over to you in Manitoba. Sure. Yeah, I'm uh, Duane Nickel. I'm the Chief Administrative Officer for the City of Selkirk. I'm also the President of the Manitoba Municipal Administrators, the or so Professional Association uh, for Manitoba. I started uh, on council in uh, 2002 for for the city of Selkirk. I was I'm actually uh, the city's uh, youngest uh, uh, council member ever. Uh, I was at 24, and I served two years as uh, as a deputy mayor, and uh, so I served three terms in total. So what you, I'm what you'd call a repeat offender. Um, and then uh, in 2014, I became uh, the chief. I left council. I stepped down from council to become the chief administrative officer for the city. Thank you, Duane. And now over to Jocelyn yourself. I'm Jocelyn Whaley. Currently, I'm the Director of Infrastructure Services for Athabasca County in Alberta. I was on council in Leduc County, uh, as well as being the uh, Deputy Mayor. Uh, sat on the uh, Capital Region Board, um, which is now called the Edmonton Metropolitan Regional Board, and uh, then did not run again. Um, moved into sort of private uh, practice and planning, working for a couple of companies and then became the CAO for Brazo County in Alberta, then moved to be the CAO for Riding Mountain West in Manitoba and for the municipality of Minnetonas Bozeman as interim CAO also in Manitoba before coming back here. Awesome. Thank you so much for everyone for that quick introduction. Um, as this show is about that transition from council to CAO, I've got to sort of ask the stupid first question to sort of perk everyone's interest here, but what was the decision for each one of you for that transition from councillor, from mayor to deputy mayor to the CEO's role? So we'll start with Duane on this one and we'll go in reverse order. For you, what was that decision based on? 
Yeah. Um, to, to be honest with you, I, I didn't want to be CAO anywhere. I, like it wasn't a job that I thought I wanted. Um, but as a council member, um, a very active council member, I, I felt like uh, we weren't doing the things that we needed to do to move the organization to deliver on the priorities and vision that council had set out in our, in the strategic plan. Uh, we were in the process of transitioning um, uh, CAOs. And I thought, you know, I'm, I'm taking my master's in public administration at the time. Uh, I, I loved my job. It was a really difficult decision. I, I worked at Assiniboine Credit Union um, and uh, in management there and had a career. I saw a career path there. But I I just felt like I could contribute more uh, at the CAO level, actually, you know, uh, get into the work that I, I knew that we needed to do as as a city uh, to, to deliver on that vision. So so I quietly uh, there was a national we hired an external uh, search firm, uh, national search for for a replacement. Uh, I quietly put my name in and uh, uh, didn't tell members of council until until they had the vetting list. Right. And then. Um, yeah, so I, you know, all along the way, I thought I told my manager at Assiniboine, yeah, I, I'm putting my name in, but I'm not likely to get it. You know, I, I hadn't had a, I had to redo my entire uh, 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 resume because I didn't I didn't actually have one. I didn't keep it up. So it wasn't a thought. It was just it, it just felt like it needed to happen. And frankly, I was in the administrative kitchen as a counselor. I'm I'm that guy that that, you know, I was being that counselor that George Cuff uh, warns about. Um, I was making sandwiches in their kitchen. So. I, I, like I was doing things that I really ought not to have been doing as a counselor. So it was uh, when I got into the role, it was just, uh, it, it turns out to be a better fit. Thank you. Ooh, Jocelyn, what about yourself? Because from your background, uh, you, you were elected as a city councillor, county councillor in Leduc County, and then you moved to another municipality in Brazo County, which is relatively close at the end of the day in the grand scheme of uh, Alberta closeness. But you, you go to Brazo County and then you do move to Manitoba. What brought you back into the municipal realm after leaving politics after your time in office? Um, so I, when I was on council, I only sort of gotten onto council out of a, a sort of, I guess, guilt. I had helped dissolve a village and, uh, I just felt like I needed to, to see that through, um, and, and help them join into the county. And so I, I got on council and again, very much like Dwayne was very much in the kitchen, um, trying to make sure that we settled that uh, village into the county life as a hamlet. And, uh, then I was quite happy to leave and, um, then I, I was working, you know, private practice and I just, I missed it. So when Brazo was advertising for an interim, I applied and then ended up as their full-time uh, CAO in the vetting process. So for you, Jody, because your, your tenure from when you were mayor to when you're CAO, it, it, I wouldn't say is extensive, but you go and you work through other levels of government as well, but you also work in the private in, uh, practice as well. What brought you back into the municipal fold, but also in the role as CAO rather than a councillor? Um you know, it's funny. I think there's a common denominator here about uh, being the, you know, the chief in the in the kitchen uh, uh, at the time in a small municipality. Um, in between CAOs, I found I was in the office every day, and you know, when I probably should not have been. But uh, so this is much better fit for me as well. But I think that um, I actually intentionally left. I served one term. And rather than, you know, put my name back, I really wanted to uh, develop my professional career. And I felt like that wasn't really happening at the town or in my small town. So I left to uh, to grow and build my professional career. And when this job came up, it was uh, it was between a CEO position and a CAO position. And uh, I think one one good thing about it is I knew exactly what I was getting into here, um, you know, for for good or bad. Um, it did feel like um, something I was really familiar with. And I made a conscious decision, you know, even knowing what I was stepping into and, and still doing it. So I get to still uh, make an impact on community from the um, the chief administrative officer level. And and uh, I, I really think this is a really good fit for me. So it brings up the basic question, but it's an important one because you've all mentioned the fact that you all like being in the kitchen. You all like uh, be working in that administrative role as CAO, as directors. You have now been on both sides of that table, at that council table, making the decisions that administration will have to sort of uh, administer, if you will. How do you stop 
the counselors, the mayors from getting into the kitchen, knowing the tricks of the trades that you went through to be in the kitchen, to work with administration. Is it challenging to work with counselors, mayors, deputy mayors, Reeves, to say that's not your responsibility, even though you were in the kitchen making those uh, decisions as well at, at, when in your time as a counselor? Who wants to take that first? I'll, I'll go with that. I, I find it's really actually a benefit to have been on council and been the one that probably was better in the kitchen because A, you know what kind of information counselors who are much more in the kitchen are looking for. So your reports are more detailed. If you provide council with the information that they need, they have a tendency to stay in their lane. And, and a lot of times counselors get into the kitchen when they find that they feel there's stuff being withheld or, or there's that possibility of doubt that administration can create with a council if they're not properly informing them. So I find it's really easy for me if I provide detailed reports and answer their questions and, and open and honest with them, they stay in their lane much, much easier. Yeah, to, to build on, uh, I agree completely with Jocelyn. I, I, you know, I think having been in that seat, I often tell people uh, being on council is like uh, driving a car in reverse uh, and depending on the, the passenger to tell you which way to go, right? Like you, you, you're only there for a couple hours a week, once a week, you know, uh, you, you don't have all the ins and outs. So you don't, you, you don't necessarily, you have to depend on administration. So the level of trust is 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 really high, but the citizens you know, the pressure that you feel um, from from the citizens is, well, you should know you're on council, you should be aware. So part of our role is we've been looking, uh, part of what I brought to the table was one, helping my team, the administrative team, understand what kind of information they need to uh, need to know uh, to make uh, to make the decisions better. Right. But but to seeing those situations where maybe you put forward an, an, uh, an, uh, a recommendation and council doesn't go along with it. Well, you can't dismiss that as just political because polit politics is not a bad word. It's, it's how we make decisions as a, as a society. So what our job as administrators is to better understand the black box th that is the council members decision making making matrix, right? Like what what inputs are they looking for? Uh, what what information are they already receiving? What stakeholders do they have connections with? And, and better understanding that so that when you do write that report, you can take those things into consideration and make sure you're providing that. Never surprise council. Uh, uh, provide them regular reporting. Um, you know, those are the things, the, the tips to, to, to lock that kitchen door so that they're not, you know, getting in. As Jocelyn says, they, they, they get in because they feel like they don't have all the information they need, or maybe all of the options aren't being considered. Yeah. And I, I think for me, it, it, it really, it's, it's still in the same um, line, but um, I came in here with the no strategic plan. Um, and, and so that really uh, makes it ambiguous or, um, you know, that role clarity is really hard to define when you don't have a clear direction. So my very first thing I did was help implement a strategic plan, move that into an operational plan so I could present the work plan to council on what it is that we're doing to help them achieve their goals. And now I'm doing the organizational review. So I'm really trying to bring council along in that journey as well, uh, recognizing uh, that uh, how challenging their their roles are as counselors and and that they only really want to make a difference in their town so i th i think that's really important to have that that insight if chris if i could just build on what judy said because i can't i can't disagree or, or agree more with with what she has to say there i think one of the 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 values of having that strategic plan especially when they adopt it formally as a council which is the one of the first things that i did when i became ca we had created one in 2013 and and it was just, it just was kind of doa so when I became the CAO the next year, uh, I put it forward to council and had them adopt it. It's every member of council agrees with it now and has adopted that, that as the plan. That's the, our mandate as administration to go forward. When new ideas come forward, right, from an individual member of council, well, we have a process for dealing with that, right? You bring it to council, everyone needs to agree. And if it is putting resources in strain, then council, what is what is the priority? Because this is what you told us. This is the new thing you've added. You let us know which one we can take off the list to add this new thing. And it's just a, a better way of making sure, because council is also, there's tension amongst the members of council, right? On what they, what they see as priorities. So as Jody said, getting that clear mandate of what, what is the, the priority for our organization makes it really easy for administration to rally and deliver. Right. Yeah. I want to ask this question correctly here, and I apologize if it comes out in uh, incoherent a little bit, but 
when you present things to, in front of council, do you do you look at it through a political lens or do you look at it through a m- administration lens? Because you have had the opportunity to sit on both sides of this table now as a councillor, as a mayor, deputy mayor, and as the CAO. So you know what your council members are looking for when it does come to these reports. And sometimes their decisions are purely based on political options. So when you are presenting to your council, are you looking at it through as an administration lens or are you looking at it through both lenses as an administration, but also as the political lens, because you are sort of balancing the needs and wants of the council with the needs and wants of the administration? And that's a very loaded question. I know you're all employed by municipalities right now, but I've got to ask that question. Uh, who wants to take that one first? Because I feel like whoever takes it first will be able to let people piggyback onto them. I don't mind going. Um, <laughs> I, I really think that I, it's both. You you had to look at it from both. That is, I think um, being a previous counselor gives us that political acumen that is so needed around this this administrative table. But I, I do it in a way where understanding how I need them to understand the organizational and operational side of things to actually make the decision or to make the recommendations and, and the impact of the decisions that they make. Um, I think by uh, trying to uh, get them to see from the administrative lens maybe is, is the way I, I try to approach it, uh, knowing how you have to see it from the political lens as well. I mean, it's so important that we recognize the challenges that they have as, um, you know, um, public servants. So I, I think it's a, it's a mixture of both for sure. And I think that puts us all in a unique um, situation and gives us advantages. Is it, I, challenging, I think that, is it sorry is it challenging though because i can imagine because i worked in administration i know i i was never cao but i worked in administration and whenever the report went to council and we saw that it had been changed whether it be by the cao by a director and what you would present it isn't the recommendation that you want uh, the staff member wanted it's now through a more political more uh what council wants rather than what administration wants is it challenging to just say, okay, we have to do this from an administration standpoint for the betterment of the community rather through a political betterment of the community. Yeah, and you know, that just it just recently happened in our town where council, you know, totally went uh, with a, a new direction, a new approach on, on a, a motion that was being made. And I, I, and I, not that I couldn't support it, but I could, I didn't have any information for them to make the decision. So I did recommend that they not, you know, uh, proceed that evening, uh, they went ahead. And then my job as a, the CAO is to carry out the wishes of council. So it is understanding that there's only so much that you can present or, um, um, you know, give the council the right information at the right time. And then it is up to them. And then it's up to us to, to deliver for them. So, you know, we have the, we do serve both sides. Jocelyn, I interrupted you. I do apologize. So go ahead with your, what uh, you were going to follow up with on Jody, what Jody was saying. No, that's just fine. And I think it, it's really um, beneficial because it's it's an education. I mean, uh, the elected officials all have their uh, different programs across the country. And, you know, the by and large, the stay in your lane, learn, learn what your job is, your code of conduct, all of those things. But I think a, a major job of the CAO is not just explaining to council what, you know, their job is, but helping them understand the administrative portion of things. So where you're teaching your staff to look at things with political acumen as well as administrative acumen, you're teaching council the same thing. Because if you don't have that holistic circle, the residents are going to come in and they're going to bitch at council. Council is going to bitch at admin. And then then you just have a flat tire. Like it's just, it, it should have to work in a circle. It's symbiotic. So is it challenging to work in the circle? Because I, and this is bad for Jocelyn again, because you're right. The majority of residents will complain to the mayor council and that they will ask questions. I don't want to say complain to administration, but they will ask questions of counts of administration. But over the last, I'd say five years since COVID-19, and I hate to bring up the C word, but I have to here, more and more administration are getting that blunt from administ- from residents. They are more able to know who the CAO is, who the director of infrastructure is, who the director of finance is. So city council or city council is kind of being pushed off to the side and residents are now sort of approaching you as CAO, as directors on their issues. 
is it hard to sort of push back and say, go talk to your council bees. They're the ones who direct us rather than sort of uh, uh, residents. I would say no, it's probably easier because unless you've completely educated your council and you've got a counselor who's gone backwards from CAO to council as opposed to council to CAO, they don't know how to educate the public on what's going on. So as the, as the director or as the CAO, I can talk to somebody in the grocery store and they're like, well, I talked to my counselor and I didn't get, well, you know what, that hasn't come to council yet. Here's the information we're looking at presenting. This is the meeting it's going to be at. And it's, it's, so it's just a matter of educating all the way around. And if, if, um, if it didn't function where we had both lenses, yeah, I think it would be more difficult. Dwayne, I have an important question to ask you because you bring a unique uh, viewpoint to this conversation. You left your term as counselor to become CAO in the middle of your term. So you knew the political landscape of your council prior to becoming CAO. The other two people on this call did not. They got elect, they got appointed into their position uh, it, during another term or in another community. Looking back at that first year as CAO compared to when you were counselor, was it an easy transition for yourself to say, okay, I know the the political, I don't want to say infighting, but the political dynamic that's on council, so I can work as a CAO to address each of these issues prior to the next election? Well, it was actually at the end of my term. Uh, it was less than six months away from from election, so so there was no by election uh, for the seat. So uh, so people were getting we were right into silly season as I was leaving. You know, people were applying. You're putting their their names in their uh, the nomination papers in in May uh, for for the next election. Um, so it was a big risk for me because the new council coming in. You know, if there was a big change of council, I'd you know likely be terminated uh, just given the dynamics of the situation. So it was a bit of a risk, but. Um, no, I, it was more challenging in that these, uh, accepting my, or, uh, making sure that I was reminded of my new role. And so, you know, I, I always call, call even at that time, you know, day one, it was, this is counselor. So I, I did not use their first names. They were not peers any longer. They were my boss. And so you have to make that sort of that change. Um, but uh, yeah, I did have a sense of the, 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 the politics, the dynamics, um, of the situation. But I think it was uh, exasperation. What I didn't know was actually how bad the organization was, right? From from a from a administrative structural proceed, you know, uh, uh, like a, uh, 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 a administrative basis. I didn't realize as a counselor how slapdash and and duct tape it had, uh, it had become after a number of years of, of changing CAOs and stuff. So and and underfunding, frankly, of, of the positions, expecting more of than what the administration could deliver. So that was the bigger education, making realizing how um, how much of a front we were seeing as members of council to compared to what the, the organization could actually happen or handle. I, I do I do want to touch on the question about the, the the politics of this. You know, I disagree strongly with anyone who thinks that the CAO role isn't political. It is a hundred percent a political position, and we should accept that. What it can't be is the municipal equivalent of partisan. It can, you know you can't pick favorites on council and you can't you can't you know use municipal resources to get other people or get people elected but but your job as a as a as a uh, as the one employee is to understand the 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 needs of the community through council and council is the expert of that right this is one of the challenges that i have now as ceo years after the last time i had a knock on doors I, I don't know the voice of the citizen as well as my council does, and I need to depend on council to, you know, we have all kinds of systems to get in, a citizen intelligence, but ultimately council is accountable for those things. I pride myself on the fact that I haven't lost a member of council yet, right? Everyone who, every time we replace a council is because the person is, has stepped down, right? And and we got, we had an election, we, someone fills their spot, but um, I, I think it's that political acumen as has been talked about that allows us to understand the needs uh, uh, that the council is trying to articulate in their in in when they ask questions at council um, or when they put forward ideas and so building systems to better understand that I, the you know chris you've seen our three one our uh, citizen support system our three kind of our three one one 
uh, one of the big issues for us was we were so inundated with um, the small ball pothole kind of issues for council members. New business at a council meeting was was filled with, I got this call and I got that call and I got this, you know, this uh, this concern raised. By creating this really um, uh, uh, effective uh, citizen res response uh, system, we were addressing those those small ball issues. And that leaves lots of time for council to focus on the governance stuff. So taking this, the, the administrative stuff off their plate in the, in the first place allows us to have a more strategic conversation. Politics, again, is not a dirty word. It is the system by which we make decisions as, as a broad society. And so if you as a CAO cannot see the issues of the day uh, through that political lens, through the needs and wants of citizens, then you're not doing your job because even governments need social license to operate. And so you need to be sensitive to those needs of citizens and, and the perspectives and priorities of citizens to be able to do effectively the things that you need to do uh, as, a, as a municipal corporation. All of you have now been, you have seen how the sausage is made to use that analogy here. You have seen behind the administration door and you know what goes on through administration council, as Dwayne so eloquently said, has one employee, and that is you, the CAO, or when you were CAO. You know all your administration staff, though. You know your director of finance. You know that shop foreman. You know everyone. Council, though, looks at every issue as a title, and that is it. And you have had to do that as well. When you became CAO, was that an eye-opening experience that the people that you were voting on, their jobs, their potential livelihoods, uh, are being affected by council's decision now as CAO, you know who they are. Not that you didn't beforehand, but now you know them as John and they just had a kid and they're down the street from you uh, compared to, okay, you are not John, you're the shop foreman, so I'm only looking at you as the shop foreman when dealing with administration from a CAO's perspective now, do you look back on your time in council and just wonder to yourself, I wish I would have been able to know this position as John rather than the shop foreman? Who wants to take that question? Well, for clarification, I mean, do you, do you mean as council, we're just looking at because as as money. council, you you can't look at individual positions as John's position or Sarah's position when you're looking at potentially cutting or adding or subtracting or reorganizing the structure of the organization. Because at the end of the day, you as council do have a role in reorganizing reorganizing the structure. While you only have one employee, you look at where you could see from what administration is telling you. Oh, I'm getting a shake of the head. Maybe the municipality that I worked in was not the correct one I should be using as an analogy here then. I, I don't think that council should be part of reshaping the organization uh, from an HR perspective. I think council has every right to say these are the services we want to provide and these are the levels and we want to discontinue a service for our community. They have they are elected for that for that right to say that. It's up to the CAO to then use the resources that they've been given to deliver those services. And either you can or you can't. And you, then that's the conversation with council. But if council can I introduce you, you to a few counselors in my time as a municipal employee then? Because I think they need a uh, rude wake up call. Listen, if you have, as a council member, you have one role uh, from an HR function, and that is to pick the best CAO, the exec. The CAO is is the executive. Uh, uh, if you look at the American political system, you have the president, right? The CAO is the president of uh, council is the legislative branch. You have an executive member who, within the policies that you establish, deliver on the services that you establish, right? But but for them to come in and say we want that position gone is not the role of council. That is management. That's not admit. That's not governance. Governance is. We don't want to provide that service any longer. And then it's up to the CAO to either reposition that person or make decisions within the organization. You want to reduce labor costs? Tell us the percentage. We'll come back and we'll tell you how we're going to deliver on that. Um, but but to come and handpick the people that are coming and going is not uh, the role of council. And okay. I'll fight anyone well. who wants to I actually declined a position I'd interviewed for where the direction from council was, if we hire you, we expect you to fire these four people. And I went, no, not for me, not your choice. I would have to make that decision. 
Okay, so I'm going to turn the page here a little bit because I feel like I just went down a rabbit hole that I don't feel like I should have, but here we are with Chris's experience in municipalities. Um, you all bring unique perspectives to the role of CAO. What's been the most challenging transitional part of that for yourself? Because there are other people who might be listening to this saying, I'm a counselor, I'm a mayor who is looking at that CAO position in my neck of the woods who might say, I, I think I could do it. I think I could be that CAO. What advice would you give to that prospective candidate? Or what advice would you say is the biggest challenge that that prospective candidate needs to overcome before becoming the CEO of that community that they're applying for? Jody, do you want to take that first? Oh, that's, you know, are, are we talking former candidates or uh, former former counselors, current counselors? Counselor? Yeah. Any any person who has had the experience, who has sat around a council table, I don't want to say MLAs, I don't want to say MPs, MHAs, I want to say former councillors, former mayors, former deputy mayors who are thinking about transitioning from front of that council table to behind, or from behind that council table to in front of it as the CAO. Um, I think one of the biggest challenges um, might be um, when I when I was the mayor, you were talking about um, the, the staff, I, I really never knew I had an impact on corporate culture or the municipality's culture, if I could say that. I had, I really, uh, so now I can see that in my own municipality. I really, I, I think I continually have to, to make sure that I impress upon them uh, about how important the culture of our organization is and, and the role that they play in that. And, you know, it, it's not easy easy for them to, to always see that. So I, that's that's certainly a challenge. And it's one of the reasons why I probably like being in this seat versus the other one is because I love operational management and, and I want to be part of uh, uh, building a strong team, a united team and, uh, you know, building that that corporate culture. So I really, um, I think I find that the most challenging because I, I really want council to be there with me. And, uh, you know, it comes down to, I guess, roles and responsibilities too, but also recognizing that importance um, that how important your people are uh, when they only have to maybe deal with me they you know they have to understand that you know the people I'm dealing with I also serve them I think that's it you know you serve council but you also serve a group of people behind you uh, that that middle of the fulcrum so I think maybe that's the one of the most challenging pieces for me but I, I think I still understanding the political um, the scene still helps me manage those expectations as well Jocelyn, what about yourself? What advice would you give that prospective mayor, Reeve, counselor, who's thinking about becoming the next CAO of, hypothetically, because we're both in Alberta and we, I'm assuming everyone else has heard, city of Chestermere, hypothetically. <laughs> <laughs> um, so the advice I would give is, you'll suddenly know exactly what you need to know about what's going on. And you're going to have to learn to put your poker face on when a decision's made that you know is going to affect something adversely, or even in a good way, you can't give that away. So you have to learn two things. One, you're getting knowledge. Two, you can't show your opinion. You can't be vocal. You can't go out to the grocery store bitching about what council's doing. So it's more important, if you're considering to move into this profession, you're going to know why things are running or why they aren't but you're also going to suddenly become mute when it comes to the community that you're working for because your opinion no longer matters or is wanted Dwayne what about yourself because I saw you nodding there while Jocelyn was talking yeah I mean we got a great panel here and me um uh the, the I first to say don't don't do it Right. Uh, there, there, there are, listen, I, I've met many council members and many councillors in, in my time who've asked me about the transition and it invariably ends up going following because I, you know, I thought a lot about, uh, about getting into being a CAO. I, I don't know a council member who doesn't think they can be a CAO. Um, but to the points that have been raised, I think it's a lot more challenging than, than council members who are there for a couple of hours, you know, a week, maybe um, understand and see. So, you know, I, I think it's uh, to Jocelyn's point of, around um, 
you need to take your ego out of the equation now. You're no longer there's a level of ego that's required to run for council, and that's a healthy thing. Uh, it takes a very special kind of person to knock on your neighbor's door and hand po- photos of yourself to to them, right? So, um, you know, it's a very special person that can be elected uh, to, to 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 take that the, the slings and arrows. But when you become staff, you become the CAO. Uh, you still take the slings and arrows, but but you don't get to defend yourself in public. You don't get to you don't get to uh, to be partisan, and that is that is a big change. It is a big difference. Uh, I would say challenge you on that for a little bit here for a second for all three of you. And I apologize for interrupting here, but it's a conversation that I've been having with a few of my municipal friends. And yes, I am one of those nerds that has municipal friends from across Canada. And we have a group chat that talk about municipal issues. Um, The role of administration has changed dramatically over the last 10 years. And I say that with respect to those who are in it, who were in it 20 years ago to where they are today. As I said, people now know who you are. While you are mute, while you do not have a voice, and I say don't have a voice as in you don't have an opinion on the issues that are presented because you are presenting them to council, the abuse that you get is probably there because they assume, and I say they as in residents will assume, USCAO is dictating what council is doing and what council is voting on, and you actually control the purse strings at the end of the day. It's not council's direction, it's you. It's a very, and I'm going to use Dwayne's words here, very political job that you have, even though it's not a political job, it's a political appointment. How have you been able to balance that negativity of what comes with the job as a CAO? Because as an elected official, you are you you literally are running for that job. As CAO, you're not expecting the negativity to come to you. How do you stay silent when people assume the worst of what you are or what your job entitles? Dwayne? Well, I, I just want to reiterate what you've said in terms of the, the tonal change that has happened over the past 10 years, a decade is a good, a good time length. Uh, from my time on council to now, uh, when I was a councillor to now, it's the role is dramatically different. And it is uh, one of the reasons why it's really hard to get competent people to take the job of CAO and why you know uh, internal succession planning is failing because people see how the CAO is treated and how quickly they're dismissed. Um, and they don't want they don't want the risk. They want to be able to come to work the next day after an election and not worry about their job. We've in Manitoba, we've had c- council candidates run on their only platform was to fire the CAO. Right? They they clearly have no understanding of how the system works, but their job they're they're running to fire the CAO. So it it is it is difficult. I don't know what the so- solution to that is. Um, um, I, Myself, I, I I take the way we've got it structured in Selkirk. I, I'm a little more public facing than than most CAOs. I would say I I am tend to be the voice of. In fact, we have a, a bylaw, a, a communications bylaw that established me as the official spokesperson for the municipal corporation, and the mayor is a spokesperson for council. So those are different things. Um, so when there's a, a you know administrative issue or a technical issue, I speak to those things. When we're talking about community development or long term vision, that's that's really a council level uh, uh, thing. Um, but but we see this, you know, the the uh, MMA, the our association, we're you know we're we're he, we're seeing the the impact that this is having, and and we're trying to respond to that. We've uh, instituted a lot of a huge change, like organizational change. Uh, so our first code of conduct, uh, uh, formally adopted, a, a member accountability program that has just literally just rolled out, where where we have complaint processes for councils to to make a complaint against a, one of our members or a member. Uh, we have a new mentorship program uh, to to support new people coming in because we see a lot of new people coming in from outside of the municipal sector to to fill these roles. So they have no sense of kind of how the lay, the lay of the land. So we're trying to provide those people support. And then uh, we're uh, at our leadership summit that, that Chris that you'll be at. Um, uh, we're launching our competency framework that it's 120 play, pages at this point, but it, it goes through all the competencies, sub competencies it takes to be to be an administrator. And a big part of that is that political acumen. So, you know, I think the the reciprocation between council and and CAO is I'm not going to bad mouth your decisions publicly and you know on my personal time right at the grocery store and don't don't ha- leave me don't hang me out to dry when you guys make a decision and and uh, don't point back to administration. So it is that 
that trust level uh, between between council and, and the CAO. But unfortunately, we see uh, we see the partisan the CAO role becoming being treated in a from a partisan perspective. Oh, that CAO worked well with the last council. We dislike the last council. Therefore, we need to dump them when we get in because it's all their fault. Um, that I think that that's a bleed in from from uh, American politics and what we see happening at the federal level. Jody, for yourself, because you were mayor of, and I'm going to get the Bishop Falls, and then you are now uh, CEO of Portugal Cove St. Phillips, and your time frame between those two positions is, correct me if I'm wrong here, but seven to eight years, if I'm not mistaken? A little bit longer. I finished okay. in two- Nine. I, I never did the <laughs> so it's been a so let, Let's say yeah. a decade. Um, yeah. Have you seen the role of the CAO change from when you were dealing with your CAO in Bishop Falls to what you're dealing with now? And I say dealing with like issues that the residents are bringing to the CAO or even the 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 understanding of what a CAO is. Yeah. So I have seen a big difference and I don't know if it's the the time span, but certainly social media, I think, plays such a big role now because not only, you know, are we taking it, um, you know, from citizens out there and we are more public, like you said, and, and you know, they, they might hear, I'm hearing out in the community, people who don't even know me and say, oh, don't trust her. And, you know, I don't know where it comes from, but also then the pressure that, um, counselors get from keyboard warriors and and that filters down to the CAO and uh you know and that's you know five people i i'm not you know i'm generalizing but you know that 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 those loud few can put a lot of pressure on counselors and and that then that flows down so i am finding one of the biggest differences and i can't and i don't envy the the counselors either for having to deal with social media but we do feel the effects of that i think more as a cao than than in my time as mayor and from a small town perspective everyone um you know knows the CAO as well as as council, but they're still going to council first because they still think that these are the these are the people who make it happen, you know. Versus you know, and they tell the the chief administrative officer what to do. So um, I I do find I think there does seem to be some some more pressure on CAOs from the public than than when I was the the mayor for sure. Overarching question for you, Jocelyn. But why do you think that is? Why do you think there is more pressure on the CAO than? traditionally there ever was because 10 years ago most people would be having putting pressure on the mayor or counselors but i would say the the pressure has been diverted from mayor and counselor to that cao position and and i say that with very limited understanding very limited uh uh sort of tenure in municipal administration but when i speak to municipal leaders from across canada they're more and more telling me that more and more people are going to their administration than actually going to them as the their elected official because they assume that the cao can get it done quicker than their potential mayor so yes definitely a difference um on the overarching level of things, and I, I can't speak to every province, but I can definitely speak to two of them. Um, the uh, the acts governing those both those provinces have changed, uh, maybe not 10 years, maybe 15, taken some to get a little closer in Manitoba with the amalgamations. They moved from an operational council where the culverts were helped installed by the councillors to a governance Council and some of them have grasped that really uh, easily, and now they direct their public to administration. I can speak to this municipality. Our council's really good. They say, "Hey, that's an administrative issue. You know, contact this person, or they'll do an introductory email to me from the resident." Uh, so, on a on a moving to governance level, that's inevitably brought administration into the forefront, and. Unfortunately, when you move into the forefront, uh, to speak to Jody's point, the keyboard warriors and our squeaky wheel, as we used to call them, um, who now can be anonymous and not just the coffee shop crowd, uh, are making louder and louder impacts. Uh, so, you know, it's not just reverberating around the A&W Senate, it's reverberating around the world. Yeah. Dwayne, do you have anything to add? Because I saw you nodding your head a few times there, and I think you were going to jump in there. But if not, then I'm going to ask my next question. No, I was just going to say that as part of part of the response strategy for the city of Selkirk is is having a really good uh, proactive communication program. 
So, you know, we're very active on social media. Uh, we, we write our own uh, quote unquote news stories that we post to our website. Um, and so we're very active uh, in terms of communication. And that's part of our citizen support program is, is as, as Jocelyn said, you know, we've trained council to not, not focus on the potholes, refer that to the process uh, and let us deal with that. And if we're failing to deal with that, then let's fix the process. Your job is, as a council is to establish systems. So yeah, there is a little bit of that. Um, um, uh, let's bring administration to the, to the forefront, but, um, you know, there is still that underlying idea that council is supposed to resolve all these issues. I think the other issue that I wanted to tag onto this is, uh, the reason why it's different for administration is because it's different for council. Um, I think there's a, there's way more expected of municipal councils today than ever before. Why, you know, we are on now the front line of, uh, climate change adaptation, you know, dealing with those issues on homelessness, you know, we're being at um, municipalities uh, uh, for uh, are being assumed to be the problem for housing problems. You see, you know, uh, different different pol uh, federal political leaders talking, you know, blaming uh, local municipalities for this, is, is those issues. So as the expectation of council increases and expands, they're rightfully turning to administration and expecting more and 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 broader services. So I just think that overall, both administration and and the elected officials, everyone is feeling this expanded role and responsibility. And there's way more lens being applied to municipal government than ever before. We are in the political realm as we're dealing as we're talking about the role of the CAO. And I want to know, how do you balance the long term strategic goals of the municipality with the short term priorities often associated with elected officials, especially considering that you all three of you have unique perspectives, having served in both capacities as CAO and on council. So as CAO, how do you balance those long term strategic priorities, which we talked about at the beginning of the episode, uh, with those realities that a municipal leader is going to come in, be a there for eight years or possibly even four years, two years, who knows? And they want their priorities done here and now rather than wait 20 years when the strategic plan says it's going to happen. So how do you balance the long term with the political realities of the short term tenure of a municipal leader? Jody, do you want to take that first? Um, you keep putting me on the hot seat, Chris. <laughs> okay. Well, jo Jocelyn, Jocelyn, how would you like to take, how would you like to be on the hot seat? <laughs> <laughs> well, perfectly honestly, I mean, if you each council always each councillor always comes in with their own priorities. And in a lot of those cases, there is some low hanging fruit and that helps build trust very quickly. So if you can deal with a little bit of the low hanging fruit that kind of associates with the long term strategic vision, you instantly get their buy in. And then you can move on to dealing with the longer term priorities and sort of teaching them out of the Mary Poppins scenario and to see past the end of their nose. But the end of their nose is the next election, though. The end of their nose is, do I want to get reelected in four years time? So how do you get them out? How do you get counselors, because you were all there, out of that mindset that the decisions I make can't be a political one, but they have to be uh, uh, for the betterment of the community issue? I don't think anyone comes in without, unless it's to fire the CAO, which we all had that discussion already. They come in with ideas that they think will help their community and inevitably you can maneuver some of them so that they fit within the strategic plans that are in place. And so then, like I said, that builds the trust and then they buy into the plan and then they can market that as look what we've done. So Jody, you were going to add something there. Yeah, I do. Th I think to uh, what Jocelyn said about the strategic plan, it, it's it's to constantly bring them back to the strategic plan. And and Dwayne said it earlier. You know, if you're you if you want us to do something new, what's coming off the plan? I think by constantly reminding them of the longer term vision. Um, but it's always going to be a challenge. We know that because, you know, uh, election right around the corner and, and people want to get reelected. So it, it's um, it certainly is a challenge for a CAO. But I think when you remind the the councillors about the strategic plan and that that they got feedback from the people, they got feedback from the residents, the community. This is what the community has said that they want to see happen. And, and I think constantly just, you know, um, um, highlighting the vision and the strategic plan of the organization really helps keep uh, council focused. Can I ask a political question to you here there, Jody, for a second? How often did you look at the strategic plan when you were mayor? 
actually, because I have an <laughs> economic development background, so I'm really big on strategic planning. They also never had a strategic plan, so I helped them as mayor <laughs> launch their one of their first strategic plans. So I'm a I'm a big proponent of strategic planning. So um, yeah, I'm <laughs> I brought it okay. everywhere. <laughs> I, I was I was hoping to trip you up there, but it didn't oh. happen because yeah, no. I wanted to put you on the hot speed. Dwayne, <laughs> for yourself, because and I, I've visited Selkirk, I've sat down with your mayor, I've sat down with both of you at the same time. You guys have a great relationship, and I can imagine those relationships need to be built over time. It's not something that just comes out of the woodworks the day you get appointed as CAO or day you get elected as a councillor working with the CAO. How do you work through that uh, relationship to build those trusts so that way they can balance their political acumen of what they need for the next election with the realities that you have as CAO dealing with what's going on in the administration and what the future of your city is going to look like. Yeah, I mean, that's relationship is a big, a big part of that because, because it's the trust, right? If the second members of council have questioned the motive of the CAO um, you've got problems that are going to manifest in a lot of different ways. They're going to manifest in, you know, questions uh, at council table during council meetings. Like, you know, there's there's a lot of ways for that 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 relationship to unravel. Uh, Jody talk, started by talking a lot about the strategic plan and about the importance of it, and, and then building that implementation plan. So that is exactly the the model that I adopted here is we, I made council you know put it for them for them to formally adopt it if you don't like it then let's change it but we need to have clarity of what your mandate is for us as administration to, to go ahead and do every administrative report that goes to council has a section at the very top that says this is how this fits in with it or strategic plan or doesn't our but all of our budget worksheets uh, you know our, our, our tactical items all of them relate to our corporate strategic plan. So we're putting, and we we talk about the priority, whether council initiated the discussion or, so we're tying all of the activities, the, the annual activities to the broad plan. And so by by showing them, because nothing, none of the the, the strategic objectives are, are doable in one year, and most of them are not doable in four years. So, you know, I, I tell administrators who who like to talk about, you know, every after a council, after a new election, we, we, we create a new strategic plan. And I, I challenge them. I don't think that's a strategic plan. I think that's a re-election plan. And there's a role for that. But the strategic plan needs to outlive, for it to be truly strategic, it needs to outlive any one term of council. It's got to be broader and longer term. And so you show them um, how the decisions that they're making today is feeding into that bigger, bolder, long-term vision. Then... <laughs> uh, understanding about you know their need as as elected officials to demonstrate progress you have to create communication systems to show the citizens that the plan is working that the plan is being implemented and that it's working and so you celebrate the small wins you know you you, you do silly things like you you put the big road sign up and say this is how much money this this road this one piece of road work is doing so you sh you're showing the public that council is delivering on that big vision and if you've done a good job of engaging count the, the citizens in creating that strategic plan there's some level of ownership over that and if you can say listen we're doing these things that aren't sexy you know we're relining sewer pipes uh, but it's tied to this vision of having a more sustainable infrastructure and 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 a lower cost of, of operations for the municipality. And this is how those things relate. It is something that uh, people can knock on doors and and to speak to uh, as a as a council member. This is what we achieved. We 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 relined X amount of uh, meters of pipe, and we've done the. So, you know, um, I find sometimes people come in with a big massive brand new idea and that's easy to manage through that conversation around around the corporate strategic plan council i just need four of you to put your hand up at a council meeting and that will be added so uh, and i will make it happen right but but um you have only you can determine what are the priorities of this uh, organ of, of this organization you have the mandate from the people and the mandate from the people is where it all starts so you know making sure they understand that you trust that and then that speaks to that relationship bit if if council questions the uh, the uh, reports that you're giving them, like they they figure that you're trying to trick them into spending more money or uh, um, manipulate them to get your your pet project uh, done, then then uh, it's it's all going to come apart and you're not going to go forward. You need to be able to demonstrate that the work that you're suggesting and the recommendations that you're recommending 
align with achievements of the plan that they adopted and they put forward. So I have two questions because I'm cautious of time here. And I want to ask this important question because we talked about advice that you would give to counselors who are looking at potentially moving into that or counselors, mayors, elected officials moving into the uh, uh, sort of the administration role. But what advice would you give counselors, mayors today to build a better relationship with their counselors that you wish you would have known when you were an elected official that you can say, if you take one thing away from this roundtable discussion for the last hour, as a counselor, as a mayor, as a deputy mayor, as a Reeve, I hope as a CAO, you listen and hear this one thing to make your administration better off than it is right now. What advice would you give the current crop of elected officials to make their relationship better with their current administration? Jody, I'm going to put you on the hot seat for this one. <laughs> uh, I really think it comes down to role clarity for me. I, I really think that... Um, the councillors and mayors coming in, really, um, I would like to see really great training that first day or that, you know, that when they first get in their seats on, on uh, you know, the roles of the administration versus the council and, um, um, and a, like the, the signed contract that, you know, he, we're going to sign this and here's what you're going to do. Here's what I'm going to do. And, and, and let's uh, deliver our best for the people of, the, of our, of our towns. I, I think that, uh, you know, I've been, I think, still dealing with that since I started here. And, uh, and I know I spoke to uh, many uh, CAOs uh, in the last year and a half, and, and I continue to see uh, role clarity as a, an issue for, um, for CAO. So I think that that would be my, my biggest advice. Dwayne, what about yourself? Um, I just had it. Maybe. Maybe Jocelyn. Jocelyn, Jocelyn, over to you, because putting people on the hot seat, it seems like you're the best to just randomly pick up the mantle and run with it. So what, <laughs> what advice would you give counselors or deputy mayors to make the their relationship stronger with their CAO? So definitely agreeing with Jody on the role clarity. Beyond that, I would remind them that they spent, you know, however, four weeks or, or more listening, hopefully to their residents and what that was. Don't close your ears now because a lot of your residents are on your staff. So we're not the official opposition. Your staff are 90% of the time your taxpayers. So if they're giving advice, it's unlikely to be against the interests of the community. That doesn't mean it's 100% right or has to be listened to every time, but it has to be heard and taken into consideration. I appreciate that. I'm, I'm looking at Dwayne just to make sure he's got his uh, coherent say, okay, perfect. Dwayne, what about you? Yeah. Jody was making such a good point. I was thinking about what she had just said and I lost completely. I pushed out the thing I wanted to say. Um, uh, it's all about feedback in my mind. Uh, 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 often and honest, uh, be frank, right? I think that, that relationship between council and the CAO, I know that there's some rules around closed door meetings and all, and that's all important. Uh, but I think these the kind of conversation I'm talking about can be can be chalked up to perf, uh, to personnel issues, right? If if I'm an administrator and I'm failing, what I don't want uh, failing to meet the needs of my council, what I don't want is for them to when they go to the AMM conference to have a conversation at the at the lunch table like, man, Dwayne really duffed it the other day. Like, what's going on with him? And you know, what I want is that for them to sit me down as a group and say, that last report was terrible. What wh where is your head? I want the feedback. I am a professional um, and and I want my counsel to treat me as that. And, and part of that is I can take frank and honest feedback, but but um, uh, to be to be kind, you must first be honest. So uh, for me to do my job, I need to know where my gaps are and I can sit there all day long and listen to the things that I could do better from counsel, provided I believe that it's being delivered uh, with the effort to build and strengthen our relationship and go forward. And I want to know that when I tell counsel, and I've, I've told my counsel, not often because I've got a phenomenal counsel, but I've told, I think you guys made the wrong choice. I want them to take that for, for what it is. This is me, your number one advisor, telling you confidentially, privately, that I think you've made a poor choice. And this is why. Um, and we have to have that kind of relationship. I will go to the ends of the earth to make sure that my counsel is successful. 
because that means my community, my the place that I was born is successful. I want my council to succeed. Um, <clears throat> so they may, dis- has, like, they may disagree with my... Go ahead, okay. please. I, I have one follow up on that sure. before I ask. They may question. disagree. They may disagree with the, the outcome, but I don't think my council, my council can never believe that I am giving them maladvice, right? That I'm providing bad advice. Before I let you all go, I have one last question on just what Dwayne said there. And I'm going to start with Dwayne because he's the one who brought it up. Your job is at the whim of council. Four people can literally, you can lose your job by a vote of four people in your council. How important is it for yourself now knowing that you've been on the council side, now that you know you've been on the CEO side, to be as honest as possible, but do it in a way that is political that could potentially cost you your job. So how do you balance that aspect of the job? Because there's a lot of people in the the role of CEO right now who's going, I'm not sure where I stand with my council because we just don't have these frank conversations and I don't want to lose my job because I say something inappropriate or I challenge them on an issue. How do you do that? I think if you can challenge council on, on an issue, if you can't uh, challenge their thinking, not challenge them, but you know, ch- challenge what you're trying to do, but challenge the thinking that they're using at the moment to get the best outcome. If you're not able to do that, then you're not able to be the best CAO that you can be. Then you're not fulfilling the role, in, in my opinion. Not to blame the, the administrator, but but it is our job as the professional to encourage the situation where we can have those frank conversations. I've accepted, uh, I've long accepted the fact that I could be fired tomorrow. That, that you know, a, an old uh, mentor CAO of mine uh, said that CAOs are hired to be fired. I get that. I understand that. I'm confident enough in my abilities that I know that I could find a job elsewhere doing something else, right? I, I'm, that's not the issue. I'm here for for this for this one purpose. I think where we get into a problem as administrators is is thinking that this job is permanent and that we have a right to it. It is a political job. If there's a huge mandate change from the public, that may mean you need to go. But I think council has a responsibility to check in to see if you as a professional can deliver on that mandate change. And if you can't, then there's an issue. Um, so uh, yeah, I think that relationship is, is critical and you have to be able to have those frank conversations. Otherwise, no one's being served well. Council's not achieving their, their goals either. Jocelyn, what about yourself? Yeah, very much what Dwayne says, but it comes down to integrity. Um, if you're, if you can't say in a professional and, and positive manner what needs to be said or council is going elsewhere and having conversations about you that get back to you then your time is likely ended and uh look at yourself in the mirror at the end of the night if you're not if you're not happy serving that community and and doing what you love to do in the way that you can do it then it's it's time to move on this is this is not a career based move the job is not necessarily location what about yourself, Jody? Last word to you before my last question. Couldn't agree with Dwayne and Jocelyn more um, with respect to being, um, you know, upfront, honest, and and have that integrity. Uh, just to add on that, um, I also, when it comes to advocating for my staff, because I'm a big believer that I serve my staff as well, and and that's where you know, uh, if that means my job to to do the work of of this council, then. Then I'm I'm confident in my ability too, and and there's um, something around the corner. But I will I will advocate for my staff in particular with respect to uh, you know they're more important than my than my job. But uh, I I try to just be upfront with my council all the time, but certainly respect their wishes as well. So my last question for all of you, and it's a very simple question, but I think I know the answer to the the an- I know the answer to all the all three of your answers to the question already. But you've made the move from elected to administration. Could you ever imagine going back to the elected side of municipal politics ever in the near future? Or are you content with where you are today in the municipal realm on the administration side? So I'm going to go in the reverse order that I start at the roundtable. So Jocelyn, you are first. Uh, yeah, no, I couldn't go back. I am I am the kitchen. I like to cook. Uh, I don't want to be sitting at the table and dining. So yeah, no, can't do it. <laughs> Wayne, what about yourself? Uh, yeah, I, I, I could see it. Um, and, and I say that, uh, I get asked which, which, which role I like more. Uh, I say that I had way more fun as a council member, but I'm getting more done as an administrator. But, uh, part of, part of my, my ability, I think 
coming from this community and working in this community is if if uh, a rogue council comes in and terminates me, well, my only recourse is then to uh, not run against me, but run and win and fire me. Uh, my only recourse is then to run in the next election. And what about yourself, Jelly? Would you ever see yourself back on the mayor's chair? No, I don't think so. I think that, uh, again, I was between CEO and CAO, and I think it's uh, CAO is going to be a career choice for me. So I think this is it. Um, I want to thank all of you for sitting down and doing this. This has been a fantastic hour and I apologize for running a little bit late. So I thank you all for sitting down with us. Uh, this is the third part of a four part series dedicated to the role of the CAO. We'll be finalizing our final episode dedicated to the CAO at the Manitoba Municipal Administrators Conference Leadership Summit, sorry, on April 26th in Brandon, Manitoba. If you haven't already, please, if you're in Manitoba, check out the link in the show notes and get your tickets today because it will be a great conference and there's a lot of great speakers on the role of a municipal administration so check that out uh thank you all for doing this greatly appreciate it much appreciate it and thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule so thank you thanks chris and, and bye Dwayne and jocelyn bye now, if today's episode sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all the diverse content covering everything like municipal affairs, which you watch today, to our in-depth conversations with municipal leaders from across Canada on the cross-border interviews, and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. But your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of this top-notch content you have come to enjoy over the last few years. If you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and the breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and as always, but most importantly, just keep talking.